All right, welcome back to the second half of lecture 3-3. Now we're talking about the blood supply of the brain. The brain itself is supplied by uh, two pairs of arteries, the vertebral arteries uh, and the internal carotid arteries, as you can see here. So these two arteries form the main branches that uh, then travel to the rest of the brain and in fact supply and form the circle of Willis, which is the redundant circular anastomotic portion of the brain. Uh, so we can see on this slide uh, the major branches of both of these arteries. I don't need you to know which one's branching from which of these. Uh, I just organized it like this for convenience sake. Uh, but we can see here that the vertebral arteries join together to form the basilar artery and its terminal branch is the posterior cerebral artery which supplies the back of the brain as you would expect based on its name. The posterior cerebral artery uh, communicates with the internal carotid artery via the posterior communicating artery. The um, internal carotid artery um, turns laterally to form the middle cerebral artery which supplies the sides of the brain, the temporal and parietal lobes, uh, and gives off the anterior uh, cerebral artery to supply the in internal, the midline, uh, medial portion of the uh, cerebrum. Between the two anterior cerebral arteries on either side is an anterior communicating branch which closes and, and forms the complete circle of Willis as you can see here in this animated slide. So this is uh, going through exactly what I just told you. So this is right here the circle of Willis. Uh, we have the anterior communicating artery, the ACA, the internal uh, carotid artery, the posterior communicating artery, and the PCA. Uh, joining the uh, basilar artery there. So now let's talk about all of these three main branches, the three main cerebral arteries, the ACA, MCA, and PCA for anterior, middle, and posterior cerebral arteries. And we'll talk about some of the branches that they create uh, and that they give off. So understanding the blood supply of the brain is critical to understanding and diagnosing patients, especially those with neurological conditions. And neurological conditions can happen from a number of different causes. They can happen from traumatic brain injury, from strokes and embolisms, um, or you know, from just uh, old age as the um, atherosclerotic plaques begin building up. Uh, that's you know, kind of related to stroke uh, in, in the form of ischemic brain damage. Uh, but there's slightly different mechanisms involved in that. So here we can see that the anterior cerebral artery is supplying the midline of the brain. So this is a mid-sagittal section. We can see our landmark, the corpus callosum. Corpus callosum is the white matter fibers that cross in the midline so that the two hemispheres can communicate with each other. That's the corpus callosum. So every time we look at the midline, mid-sagittal view of the brain, that's going to be that prominent structure right below the cerebrum. Uh, so from here we see the, the anterior cerebral artery, or the ACA, giving off a frontopolar artery and an orbital artery, which supplies the orbital surface of the frontal cortex. So orbital meaning just above the orbit. Uh, and then we have, uh, continuing this way, we have the colossal uh, marginal artery which is just above the uh, cingulate uh, gyrus, and we have the pericolossal artery, which is just above the corpus callosum, pericolossal, uh, above the corpus, over the corpus callosum. Uh, so you, at this point, do not know the names of these different gyruses, and I'm going to be introducing a few of those as I talk. But in a later lecture, we'll be identifying all of these different gyri, all these different regions of the brain, and, uh, and uh, then getting an understanding of their different functionality. So the brain is uh, very uniformly structured across individuals. So each structure, each bump and groove is analogous between individuals. So we can name them, and these hold true across individuals. So now let's a, take a look at the MCA, the middle cerebral artery. So uh, this is going to have a superior branch of grouping and an inferior grouping. The superior grouping is going to go uh, and supply most of the parietal and frontal uh, cortices. Uh, 
and the inferior group is going to supply the temporal um, branching right at the angle of this longitude or the uh, lateral fissure is what's known as the angular artery. It travels out right at the angle between the uh, parietal and the temporal lobes or cortices. Uh, so then we have a number of parietal arteries, a, a pre-central and post-central artery um, in reference to the central uh, sulcus and the uh, pre-central and post-central gyri. And um, then we're going into the inferior group now. We have posterior temporal arteries, middle temporal arteries, and anterior temporal arteries. So, uh, you know, fairly easy to name, especially once we get to know the names of the structures of the brain. This will come very naturally. Now, the MCA has some internal branches. We noted that the internal carotid artery gives off the MCA, and by doing so, it travels deep through the brain. Uh, so it gives off a few uh, arteries that supply deeper, imp very important structures and white matter tracts within the brain. These are called the lenticulostriate arteries because they supply the uh, lenticular nuclei and the striatum. Uh, the, and these structures are critical for uh, movement. So a lot of um, movement disorders that are caused by strokes might not be caused by damage to the cerebrum, like the primary motor cortex, but might be caused by deeper uh, subcortical uh, arterial supplies like these from these lenticulostriate arteries. And so the internal capsule, we know that from the corticospinal tract. So all of the upper motor neurons travel through the internal capsule before they innervate the lower motor neurons. So an embolism, uh, ischemic event involved in with the lenticulostriate arteries is going to cause uh, death of uh, these white matter tracts uh, in the internal capsule, which can result in uh, paralysis, uh, upper motor neuron lesion uh, phenotypes. Uh, so uh, at any rate, uh, that is the MCA. So take a look at those. The PCA or posterior uh, cerebral artery has a number of important branches. Uh, so this is that mid-sagittal view. We see the internal carotid artery again. Posterior cerebral artery is uh, branching off of that basal or artery from the vertebral artery supply. And it branches and travels around the midbrain, around the brain stem to uh, travel posteriorly to end up supplying the occipital cortex. <clears throat> so it will do so uh, on the midline of the structure. So it also has a number of uh, other arteries that perforate into the brain. Uh, I've named those here. So those supply, again, some of the deeper structures that we're going to learn about, especially the hypothalamus and the thalamus. Um, <clears throat> so uh, you can see there. So that is, those are the main branches uh, you know, those are easy pickings for test questions regarding uh, supply to specific functional regions of the brain. And we'll define functional regions of the brain in a future lecture, uh, but, you know, just taking it one step at a time. So now let's talk about the venous drainage of the superficial portion of the brain. We've talked about the sinuses already. So here we are highlighting the superior sagittal sinus and the transverse sinus. But just like we have arteries on the surface of the brain, we also have uh, veins on the surface of the brain. So we have two anastomotic veins that, uh, that branch and, uh, uh, and connect the superior sagittal sinus to the transverse sinus. These are the anastomotic veins of Trollard and Labay. Uh, I, I don't know anything about these people. They sound like French guys, uh, so they probably dissected this out in like the 1540s and uh, decided they got to plant their flag. But anyway, uh, they're named after these individuals who we've all forgotten regardless of the fact that they planted their flag. So uh, they join with the uh, middle cerebral vein, and all of these superficial veins, we have to name them superficial uh, uh, middle cerebral vein. We can't just call them middle cerebral veins because we do have a deep venous network. Uh, 
where all these superficial veins join up. So most of the, a lot of these follow closely. Veins, you know, typically follow closely the arteries, but uh, in the brain, that's not the case. We have uh, a few major deviations from the arterial pattern to the venous pattern. So here we can see uh, that uh, those deviations in regards to the uh, ventral view of the brain, and we can see that now. So these are the deep veins. Uh, we, you know, we talked about the superficial anastomosing ones. Now those drain deep into the deep middle cerebral vein. The superficial middle cerebral vein drains deep right here, as we can see, into the deep middle cerebral vein, which joins with what's known as the basal vein uh, of Rosenthal. Again, another guy we've all forgotten about. Uh, so that basal vein is kind of analogous to the circle of Willis. And that circle of Willis uh, travels around in a similar area, but the basal vein of Rosenthal travels lateral to the midbrain uh, to end up joining up with the great vein of Galen, uh, which is the main egressing vein of this deep system. We can also see the internal cerebral vein, another portion of these deep veins, drains into the great uh, vein. So here we can see from this mid-sagittal view more of these structures. This is the basal vein of Rosenthal as it travels laterally ghosted behind the uh, midbrain. We can see here it joins up with the great vein uh, and the great vein receives uh, venous drainage also from the internal cerebral vein which is draining the uh, lateral ventricle and some of the corpus callosum here. And great vein joins with the inferior sagittal sinus. At that point where the great vein and inferior sagittal sinus meet, it becomes the straight sinus. And if you remember, straight sinus drains into the confluence of the sinus in the posterior uh, cranial fossa. So that's how these uh, deep veins end up draining into the uh, sagittal sinus and how the brain parenchyma is drained of, uh, through the capillaries back into the sinuses, the dural sinuses. So we've got a couple more slides here just to give you a, another orientation. So this is a superior view of the brain. We can see the corpus callosum here. So we've moved, removed the, much of the top of the brain and pulled the top of the brain off so we can see into the ventricles. So this is a lateral ventricle here. This is that C shape. So on top of my head, uh, so this is the C shape you're seeing in this picture right here. And so these are, um, the, this is the internal cerebral vein, which is receiving drainage from the thalamus, the corpus callosum, uh, the ventricle, everything that's, that's surrounding the ventricle, basically. And then that internal uh, cerebral vein drains into the, uh, the great vein, which travels into the uh, straight sinus there. So that's what's happening in this superior view, looking down on the top of the brain with much of it removed, hacked off. So now let's talk about some, uh, you know, generalized larger hemorrhage type uh, conditions. So these are going to be TBI based uh, injuries where damage to the brain from a traumatic event has severed an artery or a vein and caused internal bleeding. So there are uh, extra cerebral hemorrhages, there are intracerebral hem hemorrhages, there are subdural and epidural uh, hemorrhages. So here we are looking at an extracerebral epidural uh, hemorrhage that has formed a hematoma, which is this collection of blood. So the, the dura contains arteries within it, like the middle meningeal artery. The, so in this case, uh, an impact to the brain has call, caused a fracture in the skull, in the calvarium, and that fracture, those sharp edges of the bone, have pierced the middle meningeal artery. And so it is now bleeding internally on top of the dura. Uh, 
So we can see here the dura mater in yellow, the subarachnoid or the arachno subarachnoid space in green, the brain parenchyma. So all of this is outside of the dura, but inside the bone. Uh, so this is a high pressure system, this middle meningeal artery. The blood, the heart is pumping this blood, forcing it uh, through these arteries, and thus this um, epidural hematoma fills up this space rapidly and rapidly increases intracranial pressure, which is going to result in uh, with symptoms of increase, you know, like um, uh, 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 differentially dilated pupils, uh, motor deficits, ataxia, things like that, cognitive uh, deficits. So here we see that middle meningeal artery. You already know this from foramen spinosum. So foramen spinosum it, uh, is the foramen through which middle meningeal artery travels to supply the uh, portion of the middle cranial fossa as well as some of the posterior cranial fossa we see here. So this is what an epidural hematoma looks like with the calvarium removed. You can see these large collections of coagulated uh, arterial blood uh, have formed within that epidural space on top of the dura mater. So now let's talk about a subdural hematoma. So below the dura, uh, we have uh, you know, fewer uh, arteries that, that are, uh, you know, uh, susceptible to damage. What we have, though, are veins that have to bridge the gap between the sinuses and the brain parenchyma. And so these um, superficial cerebral veins form bridging veins that travel into the sinuses. And so at where it passes through that meningeal dura mater, it's anchored. But the brain is, to some degree, floating in fluid in the CSF, just, you know, within this small uh, uh, subarachnoid space, but it is, to some degree, floating. Uh, so, with a significant uh, kind of force, an abrupt significant force, these bridging veins can rupture, and these bridging veins are deep to the dura mater. Uh, so, they are... Uh, between the dura mater and the arachnoid membrane. Veins are low-pressure systems because the capillary, they're past the capillaries where the blood is leaking out. So most of this, um, you know, the, the pressure system is lower after the capillaries. So this is a much slower leak. Uh, so for this reason, uh, symptoms and signs from a subdural hematoma are going to be much delayed, sometimes as much as 24 hours after the injury. A patient can still be walking around and talking fine before the pressure starts to manifest itself in those cognitive and uh, uh, cerebral uh, motor issues, etc. But how, so uh, the other issue is that the force involved in these injuries has to be higher. Uh, in order to cause the rupture of these bridging veins. So it's kind of a double-edged sword, which is uh, going to be worse off, uh, which is going to cause, you know, what symptoms uh, in those regards. But in general, uh, the subdural uh, hematomas and, and uh, hemorrhages are, have a delayed onset of their symptoms. And so here you can see an example of the subdural hematoma. You can see the uh, dura mater here uh, still maintaining its structure outside the uh, brain parenchyma and this large hematoma formed deep to the dura mater on the surface of the brain. So in a lot of ways, the subdural hematomas can be more deadly and more dangerous because the signs and symptoms don't manifest themselves immediately, uh, but also because the force involved can be uh, or is usually greater. Um, so a uh, patient with head injury um, uh, may sometimes be monitored for 24 hours uh, to watch for symptoms.
because the you can't just take an x-ray right away or an MRI because the blood isn't collecting either so it's something that has to be monitored so anyway that's the end of this portion of 3-3 uh, and the end of 3-3 itself so thanks for watching hope you enjoyed it